Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 17th annual Bob Rose Lecture presented by the RACV Club in conjunction with the Robert Rose Foundation and supported by the Melbourne Press Club. My name is Sarah Allen and it's a pleasure to host you today for what is always one of the great lunches on the calendar each year, not only because we hear from inspiring Australians but because it's in support of such a wonderful cause. Speaking of inspiring, today delivering the lecture is Australian Olympian and six-time Commonwealth Games gold medalist now playing an important role in the future of women's sport, Nicole Livingston, OA. And welcome to Nicole and all your guests here today. <laughs> Continuing the theme of top Australian swimmers, the response to Nicole's lecture will be delivered by fellow Olympian and former world champion, Lindley Frame. Can you believe that Lindley and Nicole were on the same swim team in primary school? Would I hate to have come up against them? Welcome to Lindley and your guests here today. As I said, it's all part of a wonderful cause, and that is the Robert Rose Foundation. And the foundation was created in 1999, soon after the death of Robert Rose. Robert was a brilliant young cricketer and footballer, playing for both Collingwood and Footscray, when he became a quadriplegic as a result of a car accident in 1974. The foundation was subsequent, subsequently established to commemorate Robert's life and achievement, and they're doing some wonderful things, and I look forward to hearing from them shortly to tell us what they're up to. We're always lucky to see so many faces from the Rose family at this event and today is no different. So a warm welcome to Robert's brother Peter Rose and his partner Christopher Menz. To Robert's uncle, 1958 Collingwood Premiership player, club captain and club president Kevin Rose who is the foundation director and his partner Pamela Watkins and Kevin's daughter Natalie Rose Harwood who is also a foundation member. Please join me in welcoming the Rose family here with us today. Robert's daughter Sally and his mother Elsie, our apologies, Elsie's been to most of our lectures but is not well enough to join us today so we send her our best wishes. We also have the directors of the Robert Rose Foundation with us today including the chair Derek Young who will speak to us shortly. Now there are a long list of special guests to get through so bear with me I'll be as quick as possible. From Collingwood who play in the Robert Rose Cup alongside the Western Bulldogs we have the Chief Executive Officer Mark Anderson, members of the board including Paul LeCuria and Mark Corder and former board member and now life member Paul Leeds and members of the Collingwood CBD group and their guests. We also have representatives here from the Western Bulldogs, the club in which Robert Rose played and Bob Rose coached, including Sue Clark, the COO. Welcome to the members of the Melbourne Press Club board and guests, including Chief Club Executive Mark Baker, representatives from the AFL and AFL Victoria, including Jude Donnelly, AFL Head of Government Relations and Corporate Social Responsibility, Stephen Mead and their guests. A very warm welcome to the players from the Wheelchair AFL AFL League, including the Collingwood captain, coach and uh, reigning premier, Brendan Stroud, Matt Morris, the captain coach of Richmond, and Lewis Rao, the Essendon captain. And it is particularly great that we have these three along because Richmond will play in the grand final in two weeks' time and Essendon and Collingwood are playing off this week for a spot in the granny. So the three of them, two of them will be facing off in the granny in a couple of weeks' time. So there might be a bit of tension between those three. Representatives from Disability Sport and Recreation Victoria, which partnered with AFL Victoria and the Robert Rose Foundation to stage the inaugural season of the AFL wheelchair competition. Welcome to the representatives from Foundation Supporters Independence Australia and their guests. From the Age Chief Football Writer Jake Nile, Greg Baum and Caroline Wilson send their apologies. A previous lecturer and 3AW commentator Tim Lane, representatives from Minter Ellison and their guests, Carol Fox, the President of Women in Sport Australia, and RAC member, RACV members and guests, including board members Julia Green and Graham Willis. There you go. Welcome to you all. <laughs> It goes without saying that you're all special guests here with us today, so thank you very much for joining us. Now, when I say Collingwood is taking on Essendon this week in a blockbuster, most of you will think of Friday night at the MCG, but that is not the most important Essendon versus Collingwood game being played this week because two sides will battle it out on Sunday in round 10 of the wheelchair AFL competition, and on the line is a spot in the grand final. The Robert Rose Foundation is the principal sponsor of the league, which is in its second season, and it continues to grow with more people participating in the sport through open skills sessions and the VWFL draft combine. Wheelchair football is an adapted version of our great game, providing people with physical disability the opportunity to play. What's even better is that the league is for all genders and can be played by both disabled and non-disabled players. Please turn your attention to the screen and we'll have a look at what the season has brought to date. One, 
goal to the Hawks. Managed to sustain in play. Brett's gear a, a bit of a celebration from the banana. And just like that, Moraldo goes bang again. So, so investigative journalism at uh, three-quarter time, but Perito coming in now. It's like the halfway point and bang! Straight through the middle. The distance not a problem. There's pressure back on the ball. Nick Bryan scoops it up and he goes forward to Meraldo who plays on and puts another one through for the Bombers. One back up to a good quarter for them. The lovely pass from the end. Think about Henderson in the back line. So he's going to try to find someone up forward to pass it to, or he might just have a shot. Sensational, long shot. The players are fell out. Both just play there. Find it. The new market, he's got it. Goes wild like this. That's the game. See the intensity of the A players. Wow. That means something. You can tell by the reaction of the players. They wow. are super means... excited. Great vision there. And we're joined by the captain and coach from both of those sides, Brendan Stroud, the captain coach of Collingwood, and Matt Morris, the captain coach of Richmond. You guys got over the line, didn't you? It was, it was a tight one. It was a squeaker. <laughs> I believe you got over the line and now you're in the grand final and you're playing off to get a spot in the grand in this week against Essendon. Absolutely. Another tough game to come up this Sunday against uh, the Mighty Bombers. So uh, hopefully we'll get over the line with that one and uh, have another rematch with Richmond. Now you're both captain coach. The captain of an AFL team is a pretty prestigious position. Why would you choose to add coach to that? We saw Ross Lyon got the sack this week. He's about the fifth coach to get the sack this year. Is AFL uh, wheelchair AFL as brutal to the coaches as the AFL league? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, you got to look. You got to look after all the players and stuff as well. We have some uh, tough ones, naughty boys that we call them, like Vince over there on the table. So, got to look after players like that. Uh, keep them in line. So that's the coach's job, and uh, obviously uh, team managers if you got them. Uh, so it's been fantastic to take on the coach's role and the captain's role. Uh, makes you feel proud of the club as well. And Matt, you're captain coach of the top of the table Tigers, who would you would imagine will be favourite in the grand final on September 1. Can you tell us a little bit about how the season's played out for you? Uh, I think one of the best things that we did this year was add in uh, two vice captains, um, Yasmina McGlone, who sadly couldn't be here today, and Tim Neal uh, also sadly couldn't be here. They've been such a massive support for me. Um, we've trained really hard, purposefully, uh, structurally, um, and yeah, I, I guess we're just, I've got this really solid, gentle feeling that this, uh, this grand final is going to be a ripper for us. A solid, gentle feeling that you're going to win the grand final. No hype. <laughs> Seems like something now was eaten at the, grand, uh, the, the game with the Essendon, the <laughs> rabbit terrine there. <laughs> I don't think any Collingwood person would have a soft, gentle feeling that they're going to win the grand final if they were in it, would they? It's not no, a very Collingwood not. thing. No, 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 not a Collingwood thing at all. Uh, it will be fine. You won the granny last year. Does that mean you get a weekly invite to the Maguire household as the captain of a uh, premiership winning side? Uh, only if we win. Uh, Got to keep winning. Um, we've been doing that, so, uh, yeah, we keep going. I've helped working for Collingwood as well, so that certainly helps. So. You've been a part of... Um, this for a long time in the establishment of the league and, and you've obviously played in both seasons. Can you tell us a little bit about how far it's come and, and what it offers the players? How far it's come? You probably look at about four and a half years ago. We actually started off with uh, seven players uh, just nationally um, and be the first coach of the national team to where it's grown now is you know, we've got 50 players playing, we've got around 90 players registered. Uh, obviously we've got the Robert Rose Foundation uh, backing us and uh, obviously AFL Victoria and all the five clubs. Uh, just to see the guys come through from seven players to are now to help with the mental health and the physical health and uh, just to get out there and be a family in this, uh, all the five clubs, that's what it is. It's all five families now uh, come join after the game to have a talk and have about mental health, getting out there and helping each other as well. So it's, it's beautiful to watch from seven players what it is now, uh, branching off to Team 22. It's fantastic as well. 
you say it's five teams at the moment. Matt, can you see it becoming a, a national competition like the AFL? Absolutely. I think we're uh, really keen to add on a sixth team this uh, coming season. I just had a really in-depth conversation with my team members yesterday about um, uh, about Brisbane and, and Queensland. And, um, yeah, we're, it, it could be like if you look at the, the women's basketball, the way that they get around, the, the cost factor is that they have four four rounds, but it's like three or four games over a weekend. So that that enables them to have that uh, international national, um, competition and sort of... I don't know, work around the financial side. So that could be could be something that we might look at in a few years, hopefully. And the competition won an award last night, I believe. Yeah, we did for uh, wellness and um, achievement. So Disability Sport and Recreation, AFL Victoria, uh, won a, uh, an award through uh, the Victorian Disabled Awards. So it was fantastic to win that yesterday. So three cheers to uh, AFL Victoria and Disability Sport and Recreation for that. So awesome, guys. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. You're playing Essendon this week for a spot in the granny. Can you give us a tip on how you think that's going to play out? Oh, a really tough game. Um, sorry, I had to drop that one in. <laughs> I <laughs> think I've heard that one from you at oh, least five times now. I think now. just about everyone's sick of me saying it, really. So uh, Liz has just looked at me going, oh my God, Brendan. No, um, it's going to be a tough game. Uh, Essendon beat us by uh, eight points last time. Um, the, all the teams have been really compa- competitive uh, compared to last year, so it's great to actually have that uh, rivalry build up and build up and build up over this season. So just to have a few points in each game, uh, it's going to be fantastic. And this Sunday's, uh, uh, it's going to be fantastic. And hopefully uh, we'll come around with the chockies and uh, we'll get into uh, Richmond the week after. So, But it won't be any pushover. We've got this... Massive seagull. We've got to stop at uh, Essendon first. Caleb, he's a. You'll pick up any crumb and uh, kick it through for a goal. Uh, but we hope to stop him from there. So it would be fantastic. Very good. That's at the Burundara Sports Complex this Sunday. Sunday at 12.05 is our game. And uh, I think we've got Hawks and uh, St Kilda the game before that and a social game before that. So. And then the week after that is the grand final, which you guys will be in. Who do you think you'll be playing in the granny? Oh, look, it's going to be a tight one this week, Collingwood Essendon. Um, if I know one thing about BJ Stroud, is that he just finds a way to win. So I think it might be the um, might be the pies. So it means it'll be a pies Richmond a pies Richmond grand final rematch from last year. That's great stuff. Good luck in the grand final, September one at Burundara Sports Complex, and good luck this week trying to get into the grand final. Please put your hands together for Brendan and Matt. <laughs> And as I mentioned earlier in the intro, we are here, of course, for the Robert Rose Foundation and to talk us through some of the foundation's work and including Team 22, which was founded in 2018 to promote awareness and raise funds for spinal cord injury community. Please put your hands together for the chair of the Robert Rose Foundation, Derek Young AM. Uh, Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon. Um, The Victorian Wheelchair Football League was established to promote Finn, uh, Finn, fun, fitness and social engagement for the participants. And I think as you listened to Sarah interviewing uh, Brendan and Matt and you looked at the video, you would agree that those objectives have been met in spades. Uh, The Robert Rose Foundation exists to support the spinal cord injured community, so it was a a no-brainer for us to sponsor the league last year and continue our sponsorship this year, and we look forward to the expansion of the league over the next few years. Now, in addition to supporting the league and providing specialised equipment and uh, home modifications for uh, people with spinal cord injuries, we've also been sponsoring programs to improve the mental health of the spinal cord injured community. You'd have to have been living under a rock um, not to realise that Australia has a problem with mental health. Um, Black Dog estimates that one in five Australians will will experience a mental illness of some sort Uh, in any given year. The problem is much worse in the SCI community. 46% of people with spinal cord injuries will experience uh, a mental illness. More worryingly, the uh, suicide rate for the spinal cord injured is five times the rate of the general population. So to address this problem, we've been working on two programs. One is delivered by Independence Australia, and it comprises individual counselling for people with spinal cord injuries, the facilitation of a, a, a range of support groups 
um, peer support groups for both people with spinal cord injuries and their families and the people that support them. They also deliver workshops on a range of issues, again, for both the spinal cord injured and the people who support them, and they cover s such things as personal relationships and pain management. Now, the problem with that program is it's a great program, uh, but the capacity to deliver on the demand for the program is limited by funds. Our second program has a similar problem. It's delivered by AQA, who have a history of providing peer support for people with spinal cord injuries. They want to expand that service to provide what they call peer coaching, whereby their peer coaches would help their clients set goals, maintain motivation to, those, to achieve those goals, and effectively be all they can be. So set your goal and encourage them to get there. Our funding is helping develop the training for those coaches and will provide ongoing support for those coaches, but once again, with more funds we could do more. To try and um, bridge this uh, funding gap, if I can put it that way, uh, this year the Robert Rose Foundation launched a major fundraising initiative um, called Team 22 with the intention of trying to raise half a million dollars over the next three years. Um, it, the number 22 was chosen because both Bob Rose and Robert Rose wore the number 22 on their football jumpers. And Robert was 22 when he had the accident that led to his quadriplegia. Uh, the, the launch was in February, round four, when the Bulldogs played Collingwood. And as you heard before, there's a, a linkage with both Bulldogs and, and Collingwood. And we would like each year to have a major um, Team 22 fundraising event associated with the Collingwood Bulldogs game, supported by a calendar of activities, other fundraising activities under the banner of Team 22. If you would like to know more about Team 22 or make a donation, you can go to our website, which I think is going to come on, yep. Or for those of you who are more analogue oriented, there are envelopes on your table that will enable you to make a donation as well. Thank you for your attention and thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Derek, and I think you will all agree that Derek and his team are doing some wonderful work with the Robert Rose Foundation. Now, we will take a break so that you can enjoy your mains, and when we come back, we will hear from Nicole Livingston. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited to introduce to our next guest. Nicole Livingston OAM is one of Australia's most successful swimmers, breaking records and barriers throughout her career. Nicole was a sporting star from a young age, joining the Australian swimming team at just 13 years old. The world watched on as Nicole swam for Australia for the next 12 years. As a kid, she always dreamt of swimming in the Olympics and it wasn't long before she made her debut at the 1988 Seoul Olympic Games. But it was at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona where Nicole made history, breaking Australia's 44-year medal drought in women's backstroke by taking home the bronze medal in the 200. That same year, she set the world short course record in the 200 backstroke. In total, there were three Olympic Games and three Olympic medals. These Olympic successes were in conjunction with her outstanding Commonwealth Games triumphs. The tally is impressive. Six gold medals, two silver and one bronze. Not bad. After retiring from swimming, Nicole began a career in media where she commentated at the Olympics and Commonwealth Games, providing her listeners with the insight of what it's like to compete and the strength it takes to win. Her dedication to swimming has also seen her awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia, the Australian Sports Medal and also made a member of the Victorian women's honour roll. Nicole has broken many barriers for women, including becoming one of the first women voted into the Carbine Club, which was historically male only. After Nicole and her sister Karen lost their mother and aunt to ovarian cancer, they banded together to create Ovarian Cancer Australia, which is now a leading national body, truly making a difference. Nicole has also served on key sporting boards, including Swimming Australia, Vic Health and the Australian Olympic Committee, which made it no surprise when she was chosen for the top job to lead the AFL women's competition. She's a busy lady. We've seen her achieve great success in this role and are honoured to hear a little bit more about the future of the game from her today. And as we welcome Nicole up onto stage, please turn your attention to the screens for the highlights of AFLW season three. Please welcome Nicole Livingston.
Thank you. Thank you very much for that welcome. And um, it's a dynamic start seeing the highlights of AFLW season number three. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are having this lunch today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I do pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank the Bob Rose Foundation for the invitation to deliver this memorial lecture. I do feel very pr privileged and honoured. Um, Tim Lane is in the room as a past speaker, but there have been some wonderful speakers at this lecture. AFL Commissioner Kim Williams, Western Bulldogs and women's football advocate Susan Alberti has made an appearance, historian Jeff Blaney, and also the one and only Eddie Maguire. So I feel humbled following in Eddie's footsteps. Bob's actions on the field were those of a champion, and his actions and leadership off the football field certainly embodied so much of what we love about our game. And whether you love or you hate them, you also have to admire the Collingwood Football Club. Bob Rose is considered by many Collingwood's greatest football player ever. And Bob and his family are certainly a wonderful tribute to the Collingwood Football Club. Collingwood, I am a Carlton supporter. <laughs> but it would be very curlish of me to be delivering this speech today and not paying tribute to the Collingwood Football Club and its profound connection to the community throughout their history and also today. The Collingwood Football Club was born out of hardship of a struggling working class suburb and it's never forgotten its roots. Just last month, the club donated $1 million to the Magpie Nest on top of the money that the club gives year on year to a joint project with the Salvation Army that delivers homes and services to the homeless. This club is one of the best examples of the idea that sport plays a much bigger role in our society than just celebrating a competition, athletic excellence. And this sporting club exists to do so much more than just house a football team on the park. Connection to community is certainly central, a central part of sport's DNA. And those of us lucky enough to work in sport and the sports that we love, and particularly in governance and leadership roles, need to understand the preciousness of the social contract that we have with our community. Sport reflects our nation but it can also, when it's at its best, lead and change our nation. I want to reflect today on my journey as a female athlete and the role that others have played in allowing me to succeed in my sport. The changes that are still to come that allow the next generation of female athletes to succeed in their chosen sports. We are at a significant turning point in women's sport, not just in Australia, but indeed around the world. 2020 will be the fourth season of the AFLW and my third season as head of women's football. And although I'll be coming into my third year in this job, not a week goes by that I don't hear some of the inspirational and life-changing stories about the impact that our women's game is having on individuals. In either a young female participant or the impact of her participation and what that is having on her family and her friends. I know you've heard them too. The stories, they start with, I never ever thought I'd see, dot, dot, dot. I never ever thought that I'd get the chance to, dot, dot, dot. We are lucky enough to be in the business of creating dreams and, and breaking down barriers. In preparing for this speech, I debated with one of my favourite female colleagues at the AFL about women in sport and the F word. The F word gets thrown around a lot at AFL House, and my friend Liz Lucan does like to say the F word a lot. That, and along with the word feminism, are probably her two favourite words. But as I reflected on preparing for today's speech, I realised that my journey in sport did start with the F word. Ford, Michelle Ford. It was 1980. I was nine years of age, and I was sitting in my mum and dad's lounge room. Hopefully this works for me. Here we go. Sitting in my mum and dad's lounge room, I was allowed to stay up through the middle of the night to watch the Moscow Olympic Games being beamed into my home in Parkdale. And in particular, I remember watching one event, and that was the 800 metres freestyle for women. And it was won by an Australian golden girl. My world opened up in seeing that. 
and it was Michelle Ford. I remember it so clearly. I said to my parents that night, then and there, that I wanted to go to the Olympic Games, I wanted to represent Australia at the Olympics. I wanted to be Michelle Ford. At that point, I could see my role model right in front of me. An Australian woman who was the best in the world. And when I started swimming, I saw no gender barriers. I felt equal, and the girls that I swam with and looked up to also felt equal. We didn't need to ask permission, we had it. And in fact, Australian girls and women owned the swimming pool. But in reality, of course, there was a fight for that representation that took place years before. The modern Olympic Games were founded in 1894, and the first Games held in Athens in 1896. And the founder, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, his view on women in the Olympics was very strong. He said the Olympics should be the solemn and periodic exaltation of male athleticism with internationalism as the base, loyalty as a means, art for its setting, and female applause as its reward. <laughs> he never stopped fighting to ensure that the Olympics stayed men only. But by 1900, the second modern Olympic Games, there was a big step forward. Women were allowed to compete in the more ladylike sports of golf and tennis. Swimming, well, the fight for swimming and women to compete had the general barriers against women playing sport, but it had a little bit of an extra theme, and that was the corruption associated with women showing their, their bodies and wearing bathers. Brings me to my next F word. Fanny, Fanny Jurek. A young woman with extraordinary talent and more extraordinary determination, who fought to represent Australia in the swimming pool at the Olympics. In the early 1900s, at the age of 11, Fanny began, began her swimming and competing career. And her dream was to represent Australia internationally, even way back then. A lot stood in her way. The International Olympic Movement was split about women being allowed to compete in the, swim, in the swimming pool, and Fanny's own federation, the New South Wales Ladies Amateur Swimming Association, was powerfully opposed to women swimming in mixed company. There were two key views to this. One was that men could not be trusted around women in swimming, in swimming costumes, <laughs> And the other one was that women training and competing in public would somehow lead to women refusing to settle down and be good wives and mothers. Even when the International Olympic Committee decided to introduce two women's swimming events in the 1912 Stockholm Olympic Games, the Australian team was announced without any female swimmers. Even though her performances in the swimming pool made Fanny a very clear favourite to win that inaugural Olympic Games gold medal, the Australian Selection Committee argued that it could not afford to send any of the female competitors after paying for all of the male competitors. Luckily, there was a public outcry in support of Fanny Jurak being able to compete at those Olympic Games in 1912. It was a national scandal. Women's clubs held rallies, petitions were signed, and fundraisers as public support rolled in. The Australian Olympic Committee, and in particular the New South Wales Amateur Swimming Association, had to give in. Their president, Rose Scott, she resigned in disgust. Fanny, along with her mate, great friend Mina Wiley, they made it to the Stockholm Olympic Games. I will just point out that those swimming suits are wool and this is not chlorinated water. <laughs> they made it to the Olympic Games in Stockholm and this image that you see on the screen is actually from them winning the first ever Olympic medals in women's swimming. Fanny came home with, two, with one of two gold medals for Australia and Mina brought home the silver medal. These women, Fanny Jurak, Mina Wiley and Michelle Ford, are part of the reason why I stand before you as an Australian Olympic swimmer. These women were the firsts and the fighters. They broke down the barriers, they refused to take no for an answer, and they are part of Australia's sporting history. A history that is marked by individuals, teams and clubs that have achieved bigger things than just sporting success. They've been leaders in making change that creates a better society for all of us.
For many of us, sport has helped to promote gender equality and delivered broader horizons and new dreams that have allowed girls and women to fully participate. I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of my own sport and the generations of role models that it has delivered. But of course, women's sport and women in sport do have a long way to go. The figures for the Olympics show us that a lot's changed. Back in those 1900 Olympic Games, there was only 2% of female participation. And 1948 in London, it was 9.5% female participation. In 1984, where women were finally allowed to race in the marathon, in Los Angeles, it was 23%. And then in Rio, it was 48%. But in Rio, the percentage of women who were registered as part of the Olympic Games as coaches was only 11%. And this was a decrease from the London Olympic Games four years earlier. And unfortunately, women in senior governance roles, it's a fairly similar story. We do have a lot more barriers to break down. And we know that this will take time and it will also take commitment and effort from everybody. There's still a need for firsts and there's still a need for fighters to keep on breaking down the barriers. And the AFLW has given plenty of both. In 2017, it gave us our first game that you see here on screen to a sellout stadium. Our first premiership, our first best and fairest. It was a year of firsts that provided the platform for a movement that has delivered so much more than just a sporting competition. Even as we celebrate those firsts, we acknowledge that like my chosen sport, the AFLW has been a result of one, over 100 years of women playing Australian football and fighting to have it recognised. The first recorded women's football match in Australia was held in Western Australia in 1915, with the women running out on the field in some pretty cumbersome gear. Three years later, in 1918, the so-called Lucas Girls took on the Melbourne Khaki Girls in a match in Ballarat, west of Melbourne. We also know that over 41,000 people turned out to watch a women's match back in 1929 at the Adelaide Oval. There's a very long and mostly unheralded history of women playing AFL, of women and men advocating for their right to do so, and of clubs stepping up to provide those opportunities. The first season of AFLW was built on some of the work of so many of those dedicated women and men who ran teams and competitions for girls and women over many, many decades. Many of the champions of women's football we know and we celebrate. The likes of Peter Searle, Debbie Lee, who's in the room today. Can we get Debbie a round of applause? <laughs> Jan Cooper, Susan Alberti, Sam Moston, and of course we must never forget Penny Cooler Reed, who, like Fanny Durack, refused to take no for an answer when she was told that she could not play the sport that she loved because she was a girl. Penny and two other girls launched a sexual dis sex discrimination case against Football Victoria's rules, which stopped girls from playing in mixed teams after the age of 12. This case changed the rules so that girls could play until 15, and the case is credited in effectively forcing AFL Victoria to create a girls' competition and pathway. And of course, Penny did go on to realise her dream, the bigger dream of playing AFLW in a national competition in a club that wore black and white, the club of Bob Rose's football club. As head of women's football, I see the two sides of the argument that ensues at the moment about women's football and the future. I hear and I understand the passion and the impatience of the advocates who want the women's game to have the same status of the men right now. Who can argue with this? We've waited long enough and we've fought hard enough. But I also see the other side, the knowledge that this will actually take some time, that we need to lead the change and take people on the journey with us to build a sustainable competition, to grow our participation, to build our audience and to cultivate our value. 
I'd like to see this done yesterday, to be honest, and I'd certainly like to see it done by next season in 2020. But the reality is we still have a long way to go on this journey. The demands that we are going too slowly should not also stop us from celebrating how far we've come. We do have a vision for the AFLW and for women's football. We want Australian football to be the sport of choice for women and girls. We want everyone, regardless of gender, to be able to participate in our game at all levels and to be able to take advantage of everything our game has to offer, people and communities. It is absolutely worth boasting about what we've done so far. And keep in mind that we were only supposed to be born in 2020. In 2019, 244,000 people came through the gates to watch the game live, including 53,034 that flocked to Adelaide Oval to watch our grand final. We have TV numbers. 4.2 million, it's a 44% increase on the year before. They're extraordinary numbers. We've had a 14% increase in AFLW club memberships and we've watched 300 elite players represent their clubs with pride, wearing their club guernseys in high performance environments, inspiring a new generation and an existing generation of fans. Women now make up 32% of all AFL participants. That equates to 530,000 females playing across clubs, Auskick, schools and community football. We are having incredible increases in playing numbers each and every year. New South Wales, certainly not traditionally Australian rules football territory, 12% increase in 2018. And a staggering 31% increase in participation in South Australia. There is so much for us to be proud about what is taking place. And in season 2020, our fourth season, we have four new clubs. So very quickly, we've got to 14 clubs. The Mighty Tigers, the Gold Coast Suns, the West Coast Eagles and St Kilda will join our competition. 14 teams, 420 women in professional environments, high performance environments, being paid to do what they've always dreamt about doing. My plea is that we remember that we are only in our fourth season of AFLW. And again, our ske scheduled birth year was next year. We are still building and we need a couple of things from you. We need your passion, but we also need your patience. Here is my last F word, the future. I want to live in a world where women's sport is equally valued and is as considered as men's sport. That, my friend, as they say in the ad campaign, won't happen overnight, but it will happen. As many other sports, including governments, organisations like Sport Australia and the International Olympic Committee have recognised, this is about really deep and fundamental change. But change is in the air. And we can't pull it off by the depth of the challenge, we can't be put off by the depth of the challenge or the height of the barrier that is put before us. Fanny Jurak didn't give up. Penny Kula reed didn't give up. Our AFLW players won't give up. And I also won't give up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you for being a leader in women's sport, both as an athlete and an administrator. Wow, I really got that word wrong, didn't I? Okay, I'm delighted to welcome our next guest up to chat to us today, and that, of course, is Lindley Frame. She will be delivering the response to Nicole's lecture. Lindley is also no stranger to the pool, representing Australia from 1989 to 1995. Lindley competed in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics as well, and she appeared at the Pan Pacifics and multiple world championships, where she won a gold medal in the 100 metre back breaststroke and silver medals in in the 200 metre breaststroke and 4 by 100 metre medley relay in 1991. Her illustrious career has also involved poolside interviews of our swimmers at the 1996 
on 2000 Olympics as well as being a studio pundit in the 2004 Athens Olympics. Following her development of the Beyond the Black Line initiative, Lindley has spent the past year in her new role as Athlete Wellbeing and Engagement Manager at Swimming Australia. This sees her focus on the mental health wellbeing and development of our swimmers, bringing her incredible personal insight into assisting them to manage the pressures that come with sport. Please put your hands together for Lindley Frame. Thank you, Sarah. Sports creates memories, it creates friendships, and it creates a lifetime that connects you together. When I was asked to do this, I said, what's the theme? And I was told that I could speak about whatever I wanted. And I listened to my friend up here, and she talks about sport, and she is an amazing sports administrator, but she often glosses over herself. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my friend. We're the first half of a medley relay team. She's the backstroker, I'm the breaststroker. I'm always hoping that she gets a good lead for me. We grew up in Parkdale, 700 metres away from each other. I grew up on McSwain Street, she was on Edmund Street. And we went to Park Tone Primary School. She is the youngest of three, I'm the middle of three. She's a confident, brave one. I'm the one who knows that I have the confident, brave friend to back me. And let me tell you, there is no one better. On that note, I was also really grateful that as I got older, I never competed against her um, because facing Nicole in the marshalling area uh, was something to be beholden. And uh, she was pretty intimidating, rarely without saying a word. We both started as freestylers before breaking off to form strokers. And I think that was probably a good thing. We were on the same team at Park Tone Primary School and we won a gold medal at the Victorian Primary School's Championships in the 4x50 freestyle relay. Um, let me see. I'm second in at the back and Nicole's in the middle in the pink suit. So back in those days, um, my bathers were homemade. <laughs> There was a lady around the corner, Mrs Webb, who made my bathers. Um, I got to buy a pair of bathers once a year, and it was normally the swimsuit that the Olympic team had worn um, because it was something very special. It was my first medal that we won, and I truly fell in love with the sport. And that moment, like for many other athletes before, and as Nicole mentioned, it sparked a dream. We were in the relay team together 10 years later, winning a silver medal at the World Championships. Don't get me wrong, we were always so friendly. We were incredibly competitive when we swam against each other. And uh, part of that was because we were vying for the attention of our phys ed teacher, Miss Pride. When you talk about role models, we were fortunate to have an amazing teacher at a really impressionable time very early in our lives. One who told us that we could be great at whatever we chose. Um, we had a fantastic opportunity a few years ago to catch up with Miss Pride and Mrs Poole. Um, and it was a very surreal experience to realise what an influence these two teachers had on us. The influences in life are all around you. And I'm sure that each and every one of you sitting in this room could think about someone that had a massive influence on your life. Nicole and I were on teams together. We roomed together. We went away on training camps together. There are many stories that cannot be repeated. And we spent years at the Australian Institute of Sport together on scholarship. Our lives are intertwined forever. And I think that is one of the most amazing things about sport. Nick and I were one of the lucky ones. We grew up surrounded by the greats of our sport. They were humble, they were hardworking, they were fun, and they always were happy to share their knowledge. To this day, it still blows my mind that we could sit down and talk with Dawn Fraser and Murray Rose and Terry Gather Cole and John Devitt and Faith Leach and Shane Gould. We lived and breathed the history of our sport. We were massive fans of those who came before us, they also told us that we could dream big and we could take on the world. 
My friend is the hardest worker I have ever met, in and out of the pool. Her performances in the pool show with the results that she gets. She has integrity, determination and perseverance. People often comment on how easy she makes everything look. And I think that when I watch her stand here, I think when I see her on television, she makes it look easy because she does the work. She's the best female swimming commentator we have ever had. You always learn something new. She does her homework. She doesn't just settle. She doesn't guess an answer and she's very curious. And because of that, every single person watching at home gets to walk away knowing a little more. For anyone who loves sport, history is all around us. Sport and high performance sport are woven into our entire lives. When a lover of sport looks across at the MCG, they don't just think about football, they think about how many athletes' dreams have come true in that space. Apologies to all the magpies here. When I drive past the home of the magpies, I don't see the home of the magpies. I see a swimming pool, and not the 25 metre pool that's in there now. I see the 1956 Olympic pool. And I think that's so important to stay connected to your history. My friend is a lady of immense character and the most caring of nature. She lives and breathes to support others by volunteering, in administration and in wellbeing. The amount of times I've seen her sit at the end of a lane, taking times so that a swim mate can go ahead is incredible. She sits on the scorer's bench for her boys at baseball and she will speak to every single athlete that walks past, especially the ones that are having a really bad day. She goes above and beyond. I've seen her cook food for athletes that are really struggling. She is so unique because she's there to support every athlete to live their dreams. Last week I had the chance to listen to Lord Sebastian Coe talk and he made the comment that sport is the best social worker that we have. And I reflected on that and realised that it is so true. It's true for the spectator and the athlete. Sport provides joy, it teaches resilience, it allows an escape for the athlete and for the spectator. It gives a physical and a mental outlet. It creates the heroes that we all need. It connects people and it allows dreams to become a reality. Because of its discipline, sports gives you skills for the rest of your life. Nicole has used every single one of these skills and is the person she is today because of her participation in sport and the influences that have surrounded and continue to surround her. And now AFLW gets the benefit. We all need heroes and an opportunity to chase dreams. And the AFL and AFLW do that to the budding stars of the future on such a great form, platform of participation and allows them to shine. Thank you very much for letting me get up here and speak today. Mark Anderson, thank you very much for asking me to do it. Thank you so much for that, Lindley. Once again, let's put our hands together for both Nicole and Lindley for joining us today. Now, we had Derek up here before telling us about the amazing work that the Robert Rose Foundation is doing, and it's time to get some funds together so they can continue to do this amazing work. We will have an auction. I've got some auction items here, and Derek is going to help me with the auction. Thank you, Derek. Now, on offer today, we have two President's tickets for the Collingwood-Essendon match tomorrow night at the MCG. It is a sellout. You cannot get a ticket to that President's function. So two tickets there to go in there and be hosted by Eddie Maguire. We also have... A 2019 team signed Collingwood Guernsey. Obviously, Nicole Livingston's not going to buy it, seeing as she's a Carlton supporter, but everyone else in the room that is a Collingwood supporter, please. This could be a Premiership winning Guernsey by the end of the year. We're not sure. We'll see how they go. And this definitely will have a Premiership captain's signature on it. It is a Team 22 Guernsey. It's signed by the three captains in the room today, Brendan, Matt and <laughs> Lewis. And one of them will be the Premiership captain in a couple of weeks' time. So those items are up for the auction today. I'll pass it over to you, Derek. Right. 
Now, this is, a, this is a wonderful opportunity. We don't normally do this at these lunches, and it seems to me we've got lots of tables of 10, so you can either bid individually or probably better still bid as a table, and then the $5,000 or whatever you bid is just divided by 10. Um, but because we need to start at a reasonable level, um, we think $1,000 starting point. So is anybody willing to give us $1,000 as a starting point here? I'm sure a CBD table would be delighted to do so. This is not going very well, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry? You get the whole lot. It's a huge package. You get the whole package. So, you know, $1,000 is nothing. Oh, we've got it. Look, table 12, a bit of $1,000. We got any more bids over and above a thousand dollars? No. No, that's it. Oh, we've got one here, right down the end. So, how much are we bidding down the end? Two thousand. Oh, that's much better. Two thousand dollars, or two hundred dollars a person on the table. Any more than two thousand dollars? No, I'm going to have to let it go. It's a Great value. Nobody else? Okay, we'll go. Oh, oh, yes, thank you, darling. <laughs> My wife has just bid $3,000. <laughs> we got any more than $3,000, please. <laughs> No? Okay. All right, we'll take the $3,000. Fantastic stuff. And as always, if you would like to donate to the Team 22 initiative, there are the envelopes on the table and you can make a donation there. It doesn't have to be $3,000, although we'll take it if you want to. Um, I would also like to invite Nicole and Lindley. Shh, 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 we're nearly done. I'd like to invite Nicole and Lindley back up on stage. We have a small gift to give them both for joining us today. The girls are getting... Um, <laughs> Jeff Slattery has kindly uh, offered us books again today. There's some red wine and chocolate in there, way to a girl's heart. And Nicole, we were told that you don't pamper yourself very much, so there is a voucher there from the RACV, so you can go and spend some lovely time for yourself. I would also like to mention Simone Yates from Minter Ellison, who has put on this event today. Simone has worked around the clock, so thank you very much, Simone. <laughs> That brings today's lecture to a close. Thank you so much for joining us for the 17th annual Bob Rose Lecture presented by RACV. And I would also like to mention the major supporter, the Melbourne Press Club. Thank you to all who have donated to the Team 22 initiative. As I said, the envelopes are on the table and any other donations would be very much welcome. Good luck to the Wheelchair League this Sunday. Brendan and um, Lewis, you guys are vying for a spot in the grand final and good luck to you, Matt, in the grand final on September 1, whoever you are up against. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and fantastic work to date. I'd like you all to uh, stay and enjoy the hospitality here at the RACV Club. Thank you so much for joining us for the lunch today. It was a pleasure to host you. Thank you. Thank you.